Financial inclusion has come of age in India. The equity cult is now mainstream. Ease of access, awareness and technology are driving the shift. And behind the scenes, money managers are driving this transformation. Welcome to Beyond the Boardroom, Business Insider India's special feature where we find out how your money is working for you. Hello and welcome to Beyond the Boardroom with Business Insider. Joining me today is Mr. Anish Tawakle of ICICI Prudential. Thank you for talking to us, Anish. My pleasure, Nandi. Um, we will talk about a whole lot of things today, uh, right from markets, you know, last 12 to 18 months, the current environment, and uh, how are money managers like you picking stocks so that, you know, you can create wealth for investors like us. Um, my first question is that, you know, last 12 to 18 months, markets have gone nowhere. Um, how are you looking at the markets and you know where are you looking for value and resilience in companies given that the last few three four years have been quite disruptive and companies have been challenged in many different ways over to you yeah so well uh, if we talk about the last 18 months or so right 18 months back markets did look a bit frothy and we had said that like that was the time to book some profits uh, but since then, valuations have corrected, and uh, that makes it uh, makes market more markets more reasonably priced now. Also, we are fairly positive on the economy. I think the economy should see a cyclical recovery, and in that sort of situation, you know, strong companies uh, with good business models, particularly those in the cyclical that benefit from a cyclical recovery, I think could see uh, could see earnings surprises. So. Uh, we would look f look for companies in sectors like uh, automobiles, in sectors like industrial and capital goods, uh, which benefit basically when the economy picks up. Uh, and I think uh, like uh, last uh, last 12 to 18 months, uh, you know, we've been more, uh, at least 12 to 18 months back, we were quite clear that most of the opportunity existed in the value space, right? And our portfolios were very heavily skewed towards value stocks. Uh, now, a lot of the correction that has taken place has actually happened in the growth, uh, growth and quality space. So we are more comfortable that opportunities exist both in the value space. It's not that we are anti-value, but we see uh, equally opportunities in the growth and quality space as well. Right. Um, I think there's been one debate which I have heard, you know, time immemorial is this growth versus value. India is a, you know, growth market and therefore all kinds of valuations have of oftentimes been justified. But in the last few years, you know, value has done well. Uh, what filters do you apply when you are looking at companies? Is it growth value, valuation or, you know, what are the filters that you look at? So, look, uh, even in a growth market, right, it doesn't mean that growth will never become overvalued, right? And what tends to happen is in periods of extreme optimism or 18 months back when interest rates were too low, uh, what happens is people get overexcited and then growth, uh, growth becomes overvalued. And that's a good time when people have given up on, on the so-called uh, value stocks. That's a good time to be in the value space. So even in a growth, the point, simple point being, you know, even in a growth market, there are periods when uh, when you should be uh, skewed towards value. Uh, so, but when I look at growth stocks, right, uh, be, the, the most important question I ask is not whether the multiple is 10% more expensive or 10% cheap. Uh, it's whether uh, the company will outperform expectations or will it disappoint, right? So am I likely to see a cycle of earnings upgrades or is the market already factoring in so much optimism that even if the company does well, right, even if the company gains market share, grows, it won't meet the company's expectation, uh, the market's expectations, and there will be a series of downgrades, right? So, so the trick, the point I'm making here is it's not about getting the multiple right to the last 10%. The reality is if it's a good growth company which grows at 20%, even if you've paid 10% extra, it's, it's, six months of compounding. But you have to be really sure that it will grow at a rate which uh, which beats or meets market's expectations. Otherwise, even if you've got it 10% cheaper, uh, it will end up being a, uh, a problem. Right. You know, I'm going to talk about something which has been the talk of town in the last few uh, months, which is uh, chat GPT, artificial intelligence, you know, bots replacing uh, news anchors or even CEOs of companies, so to speak. 
I think the pace of change has been so rapid that companies are now constantly expected to innovate, change in different ways, not just in terms of radical, uh, uh, you know, change in the value proposition or the product itself, but overall how you approach uh, business cycles or uh, your own market and customer choices, with which have changed dramatically because of technology. Um, how do you look at and measure? how innovative a company is and will it be able to therefore survive the test of time over a long you know period yeah so you know when you look at any industry uh, you you can divide the world and uh, divide the industry into some companies that are struggling right and there are some companies that are winners right uh, the the ones that are winners in simple terms right forget about the financial markets but in the real world are gaining market share and gaining market share profitably Whereas the strugglers are experiencing both financial strain, their financial performance is not that good, and they're also losing market share, right? And uh, I mean, th in the financial markets, this this set of companies is called growth and quality stocks. This set is called value stocks. So uh, when you're basically when you're looking at investing in in these companies, basically the growth and quality companies, right? You have to look at is this a flash in the pan or do they have a sustainable model of of staying ahead right in the sense are they uh, doing enough uh, changing enough quote unquote innovating enough to maintain the lead on a uh, on a continuous basis and you know yes it's true that there has been a lot of innovation lately but innovation has been a fact of life it's always been happening right in fact i would say the indian it industry right when it started to take off with y2k Right, this whole concept of moving your uh, providing IT services from India was a very innovative concept. Right, when we started uh, the BPO business process offshoring, as it's called in uh, industry, that was a very innovative concept. And so, I, the way I see it, almost every industry, right, apart from the very pure commodities. In the very pure commodities, you would say, look, if you have a low cost mine, you can you can be slow and lack innovation and you'll still do well. Um, Saudi Arabia doesn't have to innovate to be, a, to be great at oil production. But in every other industry, right, the companies to maintain a lead and to grow have to, have to innovate. Um, and and the comp like if you look at airlines, for example, right, there was a time when people chose which airline they would travel with based on the quality of food. Then you had low cost, no frill carriers, which said no food. And now they have 50% market share, right? That is an example of innovation for you. So I think innovation has, has always been taking place. It's, uh, and yes, to some extent it's true that, uh, in fact, it is true that it's, because the cost of delivering some of these digital services is coming down, uh, the pace of innovation has picked up. But the fundamentals from a company's point of view of adapting quickly of taking the lead in using the technologies that are available to deliver services to consumers at a low cost remain the same and i think those companies that have you know for them that that sort of embrace this change will will continue to do well right um, also that kind of average age of companies in benchmark indices particularly you know whether it's the s&p 500 or it is even our own sensex uh, I think the average age is coming down, yeah. you, 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 like younger and younger. And unicorns are, of course, the oldest unicorn is six years old. Um, how do you look at, you know, how can investors uh, look at companies and understand that, catch them at the right time uh, before and after they exit the indices? So how do you look at these companies and understand that this is a, you know, this is, this is a long-term play? How do you look at that? How can investors find these companies? No, so uh, I think uh, my own model is to ask the question, does it have a, a good business model where it can finance its growth, right? It has to earn the right to grow. Uh, and secondly, is, is there demonstration that it's actually gaining market share and growing revenues at a, at a financially sustainable, uh, in a financially sustainable way? Now, you know, if you see that, for example, right, if you were just to take the low cost carrier model, right, they were making money and they were gaining market share uh, and they were doing something different. That's wonderful, right? If you see some of the modern retail, the first generation of retailers actually didn't do well, right? And they were financially struggled. 
the reason is that they thought that retailing is all about stores, right? You just open many, many stores. But retailing is more than just the store. Retailing is actually the supply chain. And the second generation of retailers who are, uh, you know, uh, who have emerged later are actually working on developing regional strengths, make, having very good supply chains, controlling logistics, etc. Uh, so that their model is financially viable as well. So I think the, the question to ask is, are we confident that they have a good financial model, which will allow them to generate the returns and earn the right to grow? And do the customers value what they are delivering? It's not very much more complicated than that. I'm going to come to a specific question because you've been, we've been talking about it for, uh, through various uh, questions that you've answered. But I'm going to ask you specifically, you're looking at a new fund, yeah. which is going to be, you know, uh, based on innovation and companies that it is a thematic fund, mm. which is a very interesting theme given the current environment and we've spoken about it, yeah. right? Can you take us through the idea that is behind this and what are you seeking to achieve? No, oh, so the idea was that look, uh, as I said, right, over the last 18 months, we've been very focused on the value space because we thought most of the value, uh, most of the investment opportunity was in the value space and the market was overvaluing growth particularly given the low interest rate environment. That has changed and our view is that look, now with companies in the growth space more reasonably priced, we find that we need to be able to tackle those, uh, we, need, we, we should be uh, um, addressing that, op the, uh, that opportunity. Now, where does innovation fit into this, right? As I was saying, the companies that are gaining market share in quality, uh, quality companies and growing faster than their industry growth rate are typically innovative companies, right? So the idea behind this fund was not to say, oh, there is artificial intelligence and that will change the world. Yes, there is artificial intelligence and that will change the world. But across industries, right, there are companies that innovate, maybe not as fundamentally as developing artificial intelligence, but they innovate by coming up with incrementally newer products. So if you look at, say, private banks, right, the reason they grew was they were the first to, they, they took the lead in expanding their ATM networks, right? Then they took the lead in uh, expanding uh, uh, into internet banking. Then they so, said, took the lead in a point serving higher net worth clients, more affluent clients with relationship managers rather than making them wait at the branches, right? And then with mobile phones. So this kind of, the point is that innovation actually eventually drives superior growth and uh, market share gains. And that's the idea behind this fund, that we will be investing broadly across sectors in companies that would be in the winner category rather than in the stru struggler category. Right? As I said, you can basically say, you can invest in strugglers which are cheap or you can invest in the winners. And here we are looking at investing in the, in the companies that are winning. A lot of new age companies tapped the markets and at the time they were seen to be innovative and you know they were the next big thing, blue sky opportunity. Uh, one year later it seems to have fizzled out. What happened? So they were, uh, the companies were innovative, right? But I think the market overestimated the, the financial markets overestimated the real opportunity in terms of the total addressable market that the companies had. And I, I, I still think that that's an issue. Because a lot of the debate, right, a lot of the expectation is that some of these new age companies have to scale up to become profitable, right? So as they scale up, they'll become profitable. That's not so obvious to me. I mean, I suspect some of them might actually have to shrink to become profitable, right? And, the ma and then that's, that's when the problems happen as far as valuations are concerned. Because you're, even while you're doing well, you're not growing as fast or maybe you're shrinking and they're missing expectations. So the company is doing a fine job, but it's missing the market's expectations. So uh, the core of the issue was that the market size, the, that can be served profitably, and that's the only way to define a market size, right? The market size that can you can serve viably, uh, otherwise every market is infinite, uh, was I think smaller than what was made out to be initially. And, and, and they were able to serve the, that many customers only because they were willing to lose money, right? It might not be possible to serve that many customers if you also want to make money. 
also competition suddenly the blue sky opportunity has many more competitors was that not so you could up? never you should never like bet on a business model assuming there's no competition right i mean that's that's adam smith's time economics is about that that uh, super normal profits attract competition so i think it would be it it never makes sense to base an investment thesis on the assumption that there will be no competition got that um you know again the last few years there has been this whole huge debate about banks becoming you know uh, being rendered irrelevant because of the uh, new age fintechs who are using technology to propel growth go after this untapped you know market of people who have never been borrowers before especially in markets like india uh, and that they are using technology for to improve their underwriting process and you know 90 minute second loan and one minute one hour loans etc uh, do you think that argument still stands uh, or that is again overhyped positioning of the so called uh, fintech lenders see in the whole business of credit right uh, you have to break up profitability into two parts one is the profits you make on the deposit side of your balance sheet right if you have a low cost deposit base people like the average salaried person who leaves a lot of money in his savings account that is a very safe stable stream of profits and banks that have good franchises there uh, are very well positioned that is not going away with anybody entering the lending side of the business the second is the lending side of the business where you make money by lending money and that is a riskier by definition it's a riskier earning stream because uh credit risk is not zero my own view is that uh again the fintech uh, hype is a bit overdone the challenge is never in disbursing money the challenge is in collecting money and uh, technology will play only a very limited role in helping you collect money right by get I mean, there is an argument made that we get a lot of transaction data but the transaction data only tells you about the ability of the consumer to pay uh, the borrower to pay right it doesn't tell you about his willingness to pay and that can be tested right so i am fairly uh, cautious of uh, of the uh, unsecured lending environment right right wise wise of you um the other question i have is uh, it's a personal curiosity because you see a whole lot of transition in large conglomerates in india uh they entered new businesses you know they have launched very interesting disruptive products or services in their se in, in sectors some of them are new some of them are existing businesses where they are uh, uh offering new age products uh where do you see which sectors do you see radical and interesting innovation in india no i think uh, see let's distinguish some of the innovation might not originate in india but it would be applied in india i mean telecom networks didn't originate in india but they are being applied in india so i think uh, the application of innovation will be across the board uh, and it's a good thing that we no longer lack in applying innovation uh, but uh, the and so then you have to ask the question where is innovation happening globally right uh the most important areas obviously are ev so the whole automotive chain chain will see a lot of innovation uh, electric vehicles uh and then alternative energy sources more broadly right so there will be uh, in the whole solar power industry or the renewable power industry there will be uh, a lot of innovation and that will play out in india as well even if we don't be at the source of you know generating the uh, the sort of concept or the technology how disruptive do you really think ai is going to be because the discussions don't seem to end because the number of jobs they will cost people universal basic income should be institutionalized before uh, you know you roll out uh, ai uh, i think chat gpt has you know open ai has as part of its companies very mandate that if they see the impact of their technology to be very disruptive they can shut it down irrespective of the investments that microsoft has made so what is your view on ai and how disruptive is it going to be so you know uh, my experience and i think other wise commentators have also highlighted this that uh, all of these very fundamental innovations right they have a very big sometimes their near term effect is overstated but their longer term effect is understated right so if you looked at the internet right in 2000 everybody was talking about the race for the eyeballs and how it would change it, it didn't happen all of a sudden right in 2005 the world didn't look that much different from what it looked like in 
but in 2023 the world has fundamentally changed right with uh, with the internet and when it's come onto the phones so i do think yes ai will have a a very fundamental very profound uh, effect but it might just take longer than the initial hype that we see around it will it render money managers like you irrelevant you uh, think well i hope not before i retire so that's okay <laughs> Now we come to the fun part of this conversation Anish where we will ask you 10 rapid fire questions we are looking at interesting straight from the heart answers yeah great. right yeah um if it was a choice between ethics and profits in a company what would you choose what is the filter that is most important to you ethics is very important because a company that is unethical with others will also be unethical with minority shareholders and we will make no money as investors so corporate governance as related to ethics is is an extremely important criteria when investing what does money mean to you at a personal level well, yes. security not having to worry about it and uh, the idea is you should have enough so that you don't have uh, it should not be a source of stress what is enough well, well th then it's also about sort of managing your own expectations which is enough is what you can can uh, have a okay, not having to make co too many compromises in your lifestyle that's a perfect answer yeah. uh one my piece of money advice that your father gave you and is still relevant my father didn't give me much money advice okay his advice was don't blow up money he was more conscious about not blowing up money than anything else uh but other than that he didn't really give me much investment advice that brings me to the next question since you say personally what mm -hmm. uh, so what's the difference between anish the money manager and anish the individual who saves invests etc money manager is a money manager is a professional money manager i am very very diligent do a lot of research analyze options at a personal level i am quite lazy actually on the financial front so i should i should do more than than what i do to maximize my own returns you should be an active yeah, investor as much as you are an active absolutely, fund manager absolutely um my next question is what's your most expensive purchase i like to spend on holidays well, i mean i go out on holidays and that's where i i mean that's my indulgence is it investment in yourself or is it uh, expenditure uh, the holidays oh it's the best uh, it's it's expenditure there's a uh, guilt free expenditure it's it's fun it's not investing in your own self no 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 right. i would shouldn't fool myself into believing it's investment What did you do with your first income and how much was it? I joined Tata Steel in 1992. Uh I think my salary was 8000 rupees and it felt like a lot at that time. Uh bought gifts for a lot of people and uh left the rest of it in the bank. It was enough to buy gifts for people at that time. Awesome. Yeah. And uh would you absolutely put a sell call on a stock even if it was going against the tide of larger market sentiment oh of course that's where the fun is i mean that's what makes this job fun and what would be the circumstances uh, the whole the whole point is to sort of stand against the market and be proved right eventually that's 90% of the fun in this job to get some investment insight and put uh, an investment behind it one piece of money advice which you think is invaluable uh don't make uh, the best the enemy of the good right i mean actually just invest beyond the point there's not too much point analyzing as long as money compounds over the long run you'll do well when you're not managing money what is it that you do as i said i travel and i read a lot of economics actually that economics and history those are my two passions what are your preferred sort of investment destinations gold silver real estate equities bonds I'm not a believer in gold. Uh I equities and real estate I think are both over the long term reasonable investments, reasonably good investments. You mean to say your travel is more expensive than your real estate expenditure? No, obviously I bought a house, but I don't call that expenditure. That's an investment. Awesome. And that with that it's a wrap Anish. Absolute pleasure having you with us. Thank you for talking to Business Insider. Thank you so much Malini. Real pleasure talking to you. <laughs>